because I actually did more trains than anyone else. Any time a train would go by, at least twice on a 10-car train, my name would be on it both sides. The basic graffiti message is, you know, look at me, I'm famous. And it's, this game is carried on first and foremost amongst your peers. You know, you sign your name and you're underlining. That underlining is your statement of, I was here. Writing was getting up. Getting up, man, your mural traveled the city. So that's getting up, just like hip hop, man. Did people know that they made elaborate sketches before going out to do it? And that they, you know, blew these things up, projected them onto the trains in their minds and did them on the trains in the dark with the proportions all correct on this huge canvas? You wake up, you know, the parents are asleep. Two in the morning, you actually slip out of the house go out and you would go inside the tunnel everything is pitch pitch dark and you can see what you're doing but it's very it's very dim you actually get a feel for being in that environment and you can't see anything but you can still create something like this that's like flawless in the dark even though at any moment you can get pinched by the cops coming from any direction so you have to be alert all the time what they learned was how exciting it was to get your piece up and to see it ride but then they learned that if they didn't do it over and over again, they'd just disappear. So you had to be dedicated. I knew that I wanted to create, and I needed to have the tools to do that. And I guess more frightening to me was actually getting paint. And at that time, we were all advanced as kids. We were advanced in the, in the, in the guerrilla warfare tactics. And you would steal spray paint. You flip your Lee or your Wrangler jacket over your shoulder. At the time, the baby diapers had the big safety pins. There was none of that pampering stuff. You put the safety pin in the center of the sleeve, and then you would fill the sleeves up with spray cans, and it just looks like you're just carrying your jacket over your arm. So, of course, you would get six cans of paint, three in each sleeve, and you would do that. At the end of the day, you still had 20 or 30 cans of paint, and you could go nuts all summer. They're saying that the kids run the subways, that the system is out of control, and that graffiti is a symbol of that. No, I ain't running the Hell system. Hell yeah. I'm bombing the system. <laughs> wow, you know, how is this all coming out in a city that's so corrupt and broke, and there's this beautiful thing coming out? So. I was fascinated by that, and that's why I rode my cars, to watch people walking into the cars or people walking out, you know, or maybe from the corner of their eyes, like looking over and peeking from the wall, you know, from their journal or the Times, and just like, oh, you know, they were like in this secretive festivity, you know, like watching this stuff and being, being part of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a celebration. My cars, I call them celebrations. Even though we had the city fathers struggling against it, trains, would pull into the station and people would applaud, you know, it was just some of there would be some really great pieces. But uh, there's always a big, you know, debate on what's art and what should be where. Well, I love Warhol's phrase, art is anything you can get away with. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. My first exposure to hip hop was defiance, and I attribute that to the graffiti artists. The writers, the writers were here way before us, and just the whole mindset that the writers have, there's, there's just that whole obscure, underground, against the grain attitude, it definitely appealed to me. It's one for the ways, two for the trouble, Grandmaster Cash, show them that you're on the level. <laughs> Somebody say ho! My recollection of hip hop was coming from the parties they used to throw in the parks. Those parties were good for the time that they were there, but then the problem happened. You got the little stick-up kids started running around at that time. Gangs and gunshots, and people didn't want to party in the parks no more because somebody was always wind up getting hurt. To bring the whole sound system out to the street, you had to have a lot of moxie and a lot of balls, you know what I'm saying? And, and a lot of backup because you could get, you can get your stuff taken completely at any time. And a lot of people did get their stuff taken. A lot of people got their parties shot up, you know what I mean? When the fever came about and we decided, well, let's take hip hop from the streets, bring it indoors, provide security, provide a controlled environment, and see where it goes from there. God knows we never thought it would blow up like it did. The fever is the last untold story of hip hop. All the rappers have a story in the fever. Russell Simmons story, Curtis Blows, Mr. Magic, Grandmaster Flash, Heavy D did his first show there, Run the MC did their first show there, Beastie Boys all got their first break at the Fever. 
Love Bug Star G at the Disco Fever every Monday night. Check them out. Right about now, Notorious 2. Like this. Ha. My father went and opened up a club for me in 76. The grand opening was Disco Fever, and my father wound up putting a white DJ in the club. And he wasn't working out. But I notice every time this other DJ leaves and G gets on, the crowd is just picking up. Now, the night's supposed to be ending, but the energy level of the crowd is picking up. And he's rhyming over the, over the records. And I'm like, what the hell is he doing? When Sal was there and he heard that, he looked up again and was like, what the heck was that? And then he saw the reaction from the crowd, like everybody, ho, ho, you know, they started jumping and everything. He was like, what's going on here? I had my dentist come in there. He's a white guy. And then I had a lawyer. And then I had a pimp. And then I had a hooker. And then I had a drug dealer. And then I had a bank robber. But at that point, they were all as one. Nobody was thinking about nobody as anything different. Who had more money, less money? Who was more dangerous? Who wasn't? Who was afraid? Who wasn't afraid? At that point, everybody was just having a good time because of this rhyming over the music. I said, gee, who's the biggest DJs around? G told me the Grandmaster Flash is playing at a pump. And Flash is scratching, and he's turning around with his elbows, and he gets up with his feet, and he's scratching with his feet, and he blindfolds himself, and he, he was just unbelievable. So I said, this guy's like a show within himself. And I approached Flash about playing in the club. And I said, look, you come here, I'm going to guarantee you become a star because you're going to have a place where people can come see you every week on a weekly basis. So here it is, going to be the first hip-hop night. Grandmaster Flash at the Fever on a Tuesday. I only had five days advertising, made little bullshit paper flyers. And this guy, 600 people show up. And the gimmick was a dollar to get in, a dollar a drink. And we ran that night, I mean, we ran around like chickens without a head, but it was such a big thing. And the kids got the word out, and it just, it just blossomed from there. Now everybody's talking about it. Holy shit, the fever's packed. There's a million people over there. But it was, it was teenagers, you know? And we knew we could pack the kids in. And when we started allowing them to come in with sneakers, that was it. 600 people again the next week. And then it was just every weekend. And then I started, I had to make more revenue because we needed bounces because it was getting wild and it was too many people. So what I came up, I was the first one to do a dollar to get in because I didn't want to change the dollar, but five dollars were sneakers. But everybody wore sneakers. But if you wore shoes, you got it for a buck. And back in that time, drugs was hot. Cocaine, dust, angel dust was real prevalent. We knew people were going to do it, but we provided a safety system for the people that came up there. We had a little red light buzzer system that set up in the cashier booth downstairs, which flashed in the DJ booth, which the DJ, when he saw that, he knew to say Code Blue. And everybody had gotten a customer. When Code Blue was said, that means the police are coming upstairs. It was just like a speakeasy, the old speakeasies back in the 20s. So when that light went off, the DJ, no matter what he was doing, he could be in the middle of a rap or rhyme or whatever, he knew that light go off, code blue, code blue. Everything would disappear. If it was on the tables or whatever, somebody was doing it in the corner, it was gone. Not only that, the police department loved us too. Because we took five, 600 kids off the streets, put them inside of a building, a controlled environment. So if they were looking for somebody to stuck somebody up, what would they do? They come up to the club and look around to see if they can find them. Grandmaster Flash, who got discovered at the fever, just got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And you know what? That says it all. 
A killer who has roamed the boroughs of New York for the past year has struck again. The killer's eighth attack in just over a year came on this lonely street in Brooklyn. Police poured over the car where the young couple was shot. Two witnesses say the gunman walked up to the car, crouched, then fired four shots through an open window. He was covered with blood. The girl was covered with blood. It was a horror. This guy screaming, just screaming and screaming. We always looked at some summonses that were issued in the general area where the crime was committed. It so happened in Brooklyn when Moskowitz gets murdered. We started looking at the summonses again. When we do, we find a double park summons issued by a, a hydrant to a car registered up in Yonkers. So they checked the ticket out, and it was to a David Berkowitz, Pine Street, Yonkers, New York. So they call up the Yonkers, and the Yonkers police said, that guy's a pain in the neck. We've had a lot of trouble with him. So now everybody's antenna gets raised. They stake out the car. Berkowitz comes out of his apartment house. He approaches the car. They go over to him. They identify themselves, and he says, well, you got me. I'm the son of Sam. He admitted it right then and there. This is the man police say is the 44 caliber killer. Young, dark-haired, almost chubby. They found hundreds of rounds of ammunition and two more guns, including a machine gun that detectives said Berkowitz planned to use in his next attack, which they said was planned for a Long Island disco. In the end, it was something as simple as his $25 parking ticket that led police to the killer. Which leads to the, the, the joke that in, in New York you can, uh, you can get away with murder as long as you don't park at a fire hydrant. He wore a fake smile as police moved him around the city today from arrest to booking to court, finally to a mental ward. And I'll never forget, I was in uh, a club that night, the night he got caught. And I couldn't believe the joy of how everybody was hugging and 